Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we want to start by recognizing that UBC is on the traditional, ancestral, unceded, and stolen lands of the Hunkaminum speaking Musqueam people who have inhabited these lands and waters since time immemorial and who continue Musqueam culture here today. Because we are meeting in digital space, I want to invite you to please share in the chat the indigenous lands upon which you find yourself right now. I'm on Squamish territory. On behalf of the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, I'm honored to present Dr. Annalise Lowellen, who is currently moving from UCSB in Santa Barbara to the University of Victoria as an Associate Professor of Pacific and Asian Studies. Lowellen's research focuses on transnational civil society, environmental justice, embodiment, and indigenous communities in contemporary Japan and across Asia. In her upcoming book, Sovereign Bodies, Energy, Colonialism, and Defining the State in India and Japan, she analyzes civil society movements targeting Japan's technological diplomacy in India's growing energy sector, juxtaposed with indigenous communities' use of social ecological knowledge to defend their lands. As we will see in this talk, she adopts an anti-colonial and environmental justice framework to collaborate with indigenous communities through cultural mapping techniques in order to resist eco-cultural degradation of land, water, and indigenous knowledges. This talk is hosted in partnership with both the Interdisciplinary Histories Research Cluster and the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability. At the end of the talk, Dr. Ramana, the director of the Liu Institute for Global Issues, will be facilitating a questions period. Please join me in a silent air clap to welcome Dr. Lowellen on our virtual UBC space, and it's an honor to have us here with you today. Haku, can you hear me? Okay. Haku, I respectfully raise my hands to the Musqueam people from Shmuwich, the coastal band of the Chumash Nation, where I reside as a guest. Shmuwich, where I now stand, has long served as a place of learning for the Chumash peoples before UCSB colonized this land. I express my deepest condolences to the indigenous First Nations who are grieving the loss of generations of children in the residential schools. Energy and nuclear colonialism, the subjects of today's talk, are entangled with the theft of indigenous lands by removing indigenous children from their homes and the warm embrace of their culture to empty the land for mining and energy colonialism. Settler colonial science has long served as enabler of this violence. My hope is to honor the generosity of the indigenous perspectives herein to illuminate the settler infrastructures linking these landscapes of violence in order to strive toward anti-colonial futures. If you go to these contaminated sites, you don't see this, whatever it is there. It goes through your body, that radioactive waste. You don't see it, but it's there. It would injure your blood cells, and then it would turn against itself in 10 to 20 years and become tumors or cancer. And that's what happens. These are the words of one scientist who privately explained to a Dene, now the Delene Gotine people, in the Northwest Territories, explain to this Dene uranium ore carrier the hazards of uranium. This is one of the very few records I'm actually aware of, of a scientist actually communicating the risks of uranium or nuclearity to an indigenous community. For uranium miners, the biological impacts of exposure may not manifest for 15 years or more. For children born to mothers exposed to internal radiation, the biological effects may manifest at birth or may not make themselves known until age 5, 10, or even 15 years. In this way, radionuclides squirrel themselves away in the human genome, slowly releasing their barrage of radioactive decay on the bone, organs, and chromosomes of human beings. 
they may or may not be biologically expressed in physical conditions, depending on a number of factors, both genetic and environmental, thus confounding indigenous and other slow violence exposed communities even more, because not every human responds in identical ways. The capriciousness of these radionuclides and their alpha, beta, gamma rays is another reason it has been so difficult for impacted communities to hold private and public sector mining uh, corporations accountable. The sickness evolves slowly and unpredictably. Thus, it is quite difficult to trace the chain of causality and to correlate the radioactive debris with sickened or genetically harmed human beings and their animals and plant relatives. And there are hurdles to be overcome before the evidence is considered adequate. But my presentation today is not to dwell in the past devastation and the erasure. Instead, I hope to foreground this indigenous accounting and urge us to take seriously these indigenous responses to these anticipated hazards and actually experienced disasters from the long arc of the nuclear fuel chain. Indigenous communities demand the sovereign right to shape their futures in ways that foster physical and emotional health, as well as cultural thriving and re-indigenization. Today, I want to shift our attention to these bodies of evidence resulting from the nuclear colonialism that is spreading around the world, thanks in part to the new interest in expanding nuclear energy to fight climate change. Uncontrollable radiation is like a vicious god. This is the stark warning of Ainu activist and musician Oki, uh, Kano Oki, shortly after Japan's triple meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. The supply chain needed to generate nuclear energy binds indigenous peoples and their more than human relations in a complex cartography across multiple continents. In Oki's statement to the UN Indigenous Peoples Forum, he raised an alarm that Fukushima's uranium was sourced from lands tended by Australian traditional owners or Aboriginal traditional owners. What Oki did not anticipate in 2011 is this, less than a decade after the devastation of Japan's 311 nuclear disaster, Oki's ancestral homeland of Yaunkuru Moshiri, which is present day Hokkaido, would bid to ho host a deep ge geological repository to store high level nuclear waste in the small town of Sutsu. Meanwhile, across the Pacific in Noya Segovia, the Western Shoshone homeland, present day Nevada, the Shoshone people face proposals to store similarly high level nuclear waste at Yucca Mountain, an area where powerful medicines are cultivated. And India in the midst of its own nuclear expansion is rushing to free the limited uranium from soil occupied by indigenous landholders across the country. By virtue of their subterranean wealth, each of these indigenous nations is bound through nuclear colonialism into relations with the more than humans and their settler occupiers. Due to these relations in their homelands, indigenous peoples are in fact disproportionately burdened and sickened by uranium and nuclear waste. Too often, they have been the very last to be informed that radiation, heavy metals and nuclear byproducts have long lasting impacts that outlive their most sacred relations in the land and the water. There is a well-established correlation between uranium extraction, nuclear testing, and waste disposal on indigenous land, which mirrors the operation of environmental racism in communities of color. If quantifying this makes it a little clearer, then we can put it this way, an estimated 70% of the uranium, uranium, excuse me, 70% of the uranium powering the globe's nuclear reactors is extracted from indigenous lands, who therein suffer a disproportionate impact from mining, processing, and waste. Indigenous people's ecosystems, their livelihoods, and their relations with the more than humans are impacted at every stage of this cycle. In this way, as Oki described it, radiation is indeed a vicious god that quickly outlives its welcome in indigenous lands, triggering health impacts and metamorphosis of the land, which may take decades to emerge, but continue to transmogrify the human and physical landscape for centuries. Indigenous scholar Dina Gillia Whitaker, 
uh, of the Colville tribes nation, writes that settler colonialism poses an existential threat to indigenous peoples by severing their ability to experience the world through removal from land and by shutting off their access to the more than human relations in the land. With nuclear colonialism, these barriers proliferate. That is, the barriers to thriving erected by uranium and nuclearity are ontological, epistemological, and existential. And by this, I mean that they pose threats to the possibility of honoring all relations, the ways of being and knowing in the world, and ultimately to the capacity to exist. In the vision of indigenous peoples, nuclearity anticipates the conditions for genocide as an existential threat, epistemicide, the death of knowledge, and echocide, the death of all life. To be clear, by epistemicide, I mean that if the capacity to interact with one's plant, animal, geological, and sacred relations, according to their ancestral teachings, becomes impossible due to contaminated land or being eliminated from a nation's land, then the knowledge that sustains these practices will also die. That is the future we choose if we choose the future of nuclear energy from the perspective of nuclear energy and the other forms of the nuclear industry uh, proposes from the perspective of indigenous communities. Indigenous accounting then fosters the conditions for repair and reconciliation with the ancestors, the more than humans and all the land and water relations. But first, indigenous accounting demands accountability, reconciliation and justice. Accounting in the hands of indigenous guides may not translate onto spreadsheets or bean counting, uh, but instead this accounting targets biodiversity and fosters medicinal beans, such as mesquites, pine nuts, or ground nuts. In the words of Western Shoshone activist Ian Zabarte, I do this for my family and my ancestors. I am an accountant for my people. And right now I am hunting the criminals who dumped 600, 800, excuse me, who dumped 6,800 weapons of mass destruction in our ancestors' land. One of the biggest challenges with radioactive and fissile materials is the invisible traces they leave in the soil, water, and air. Radiation's earliest documented health impacts trace back to Renaissance era metal miners in Eastern Europe's Ertz Mountains, who contracted pulmonary diseases and cancer uh, roughly 15 years or so after they extracted radium in 1500, but no one knew at the time what was happening to them. Scientists involved in the Manhattan Project knew this, and they chose not to inform the Navajo whose land was being mined. They were compelled by an urgency to, to find domestic uranium to feed the Manhattan Engineering Project labs. It needed to be kept confidential, and there was no time for monitor monitoring health. Navajo lands and the Colorado Plateau, as pictured here in this uh, map, uh, supplied 12.5% of the total uranium uh, for the Manhattan Project. And this was combined with 11% from Canada, from the El Dorado mines uh, in Delanegotene uh, nation lands, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then the, the remaining 76.5% um, was sourced from the Belgian Congo, which was one of the largest uh, uranium mines at the time. After the successful Trinity test in July of 1945, which then led to the US bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, the pattern of carving out Navajo lands for fissile materials became as well established and educating the Navajo nation about any risks to Dine, excuse me, to Dine Bikaya, their nation was shelved. This obsession with secrecy and uranium being positioned as a national security issue pervades almost every case of nuclear colonialism I discussed today. The experts intentionally hid the information from local communities, even when they began medical monitoring of Navajo miners' health in the 1950s. Tragically, the first and second generation of Navajo miners and their families used tailing rocks to build, excuse me, to build foundations uh, for their homes. They crushed the rock to lay the earthen floors of the whole one, 
Uh, they built bread ovens, water cisterns, and even play areas for children, all from highly radioactive tailing debris. When the mine pits were closed and they filled naturally in the springs with rainwater, um, families and even pregnant women drank the cool water, which was laced with arsenic, cadmium, and many other heavy metals directly from these old mine pits. And a generation of nearly 150 children, um, according to the records, generation of nearly 150 children were born with a debilitating condition known as Navajo neuropathy. Refusal to share this knowledge endangered indigenous peoples and forced them to devise their own systems for documenting the transformation of their lands for extractive industries. Today, the Navajo Nation has spent decades seeking justice and a pathway for thriving in their ancestral land. They have commissioned health studies, heavy metals and toxicant studies, fought court cases, presented hearings to the US Congress, demanded new homes compensation, and fought for decades to rehabilitate their land, water, and relations therein. Among these efforts, one of the most challenging, and this is true beyond the Navajo Nation um, in many indigenous communities across the world, is this vexing problem. How do we translate the odorless, colorless, the hazards of an odorless, colorless invader into a cultural vernacular that makes sense? This was an urgent and difficult task. And incredibly, a team of Navajo high school students from Monument Valley High School accomplished this with their 1998 documentary film, Hear Our Voices. And this is the story of the monster of, of Teizo. To fully grasp the shape-shifting character of uranium radiation, technically Radon and Radon's daughters, the students appealed to the literary traditions such as the Navajo way, which provides hints about how Navajo should address problems like uranium. According to these teachings, quote, in ancient times, Navajo people were destroyed by monsters that roamed their traditional lands. In those days, the deity Changing Woman gave birth to hero twins. The twins went through many trials and gained much wisdom from supernatural beings to, to acquire the skills to kill monsters. The first monster the twins slew was Yeitso, the big monster. He was the biggest and worst of the monsters and he roamed Mount Taylor where the world's largest underground uranium mine would be built. When the students dramatized the story uh, in the film, they changed Yeitso to Teitso, yellow dirt or uranium in the Navajo language. And thus uranium became a monster in the Navajo pantheon. This narrative was coupled with Navajo teachings that humans should not dig into the earth, especially with steel tools or machines. Changing woman, who bore the twins that slayed the, the uranium monster is in fact mother earth. And this teaching emphasizes that she must be respected and honored, not carved up or trampled upon. And the message that Teizo should not be disturbed is clear and culturally relevant. So the birth of the atomic age, as I mentioned, uh, comes from three different locations. Um, and here is a, uh, an example of the sort of marriage of, two of the, the Alamogordo uh, Trinity test with um, pitch blend, which is actually radium and uranium sourced from El Dorado uh, mine, which is at the Great Bear Lake in Delene Gotine uh, nation lands. Commercial nuclear energy came into existence not to help us solve the climate change dilemma or even to help nations like Japan achieve energy independence. Instead, nuclear power was first born from the US government's need for a smokescreen in order to distract from its ongoing development of nuclear weapons technology during the Cold War. Nuclear energy has, was thus born violent, as Bo Roberts has written. And nowhere is this legacy of settler nuclearity more apparent than Canada's Delaunay community and the Navajo Nation, as I just described. In the 1940s, before uh, Navajo Nation uranium um, deposits were discovered, Canada's El Dorado mine on Great Bear Lake provided the only known source of uranium in the North American continent. Supplying uranium to the US government came at great cost to the Delaunay people, but the inaccessible location of El Dorado mine, it was just south of the Arctic Circle and the 1200 miles 
distance from the nearest railroad posed a serious obstacle. Myriad histories have chronicled the difficulty of this journey and the technological fixes, including building transport infrastructure to get the ore to uh, the refinery in Port Hope. But very few of these chronicles reveal the hidden labor force that made the ore's transport viable. There's a 20, it's a, a 2,100 kilometer journey from Port Radium to Port Hope. And this becomes known as the Highway of the Atom. But the important piece that's often erased is in the telling of this is that from 1942 to 1960, indigenous Diné workers hauled 100 pound bags pictured here of pitch blend or 12 hours a day, six days a week uh, during the summer months because this area is very close to the Arctic Circle and it freezes up, of course, in the wintertime. Um, neither Diné nor non-native laborers were informed about the contents of the sacks. Um, and in the evenings, uh, they would uh, change their ore drenched clothing directly inside their camp tents, where their entire families, women and children, um, all of them lived together and shared the dust that was coming off of the, the work clothes. Over time, Dene workers breathed in the dust from this ore. They also consumed the fish from the contaminated waterways. Um, Many times they would sleep on the sacks of ore as they were carried on these barges. Women whose husbands worked on these barges used the empty uranium sacks to fashion tent shelters for their families and children often played in the piles of ore, which seemed just like a giant sandbox. No mine official or government uh, agent ever informed the Dene community or non-Indigenous miners about the potential of health risks. But when the community began to experience a rash of cancer, um, and deaths in the 1980s through the 1990s, they began first began to recognize that they had been exposed to a dangerous toxin, which only um, began to show up after the mine was long closed. The community most impacted by this mine uh, came to be known as the Village of Win Widows um, due to the hollowing out of an entire generation of elders from these cancer-related deaths. Um, which are believed to be connected to the uranium mine. Uh, and this is Port Radium uh, with the barges that are now covered up. The Delinet community as atonement undertook a journey to Hiroshima for the, for the anniversary of the first US, or excuse me, of the first atomic bombing in warfare, an act of violence for which the Delinet felt directly implicated. In the words of one former Dene air care, or carrier Alfred Tanito at Sombaco, which is Port Radium, uh, the rocks were found. The poison they took out, they made a powerful weapon out of it. So they dropped it on another country and the people from that country also suffered. We think about that. It came from our land to be used to make another people suffer. After laying a wreath, <clears throat> and offering prayers during the memorial ceremony, the Delaney group also visited uh, Hibaksha or A-bomb exposed persons at the Korean Hibaksha hospital uh, there in Hiroshima. The Delaney people felt a strong need to forge bonds of solidarity and peace and to work against the violent deployment of their own relations from their land. And in 2016, the Delaney Gotene have inaugurated a new era of self-governance. Um, and as part of that, they've begun actively um, seeking remediation of the Great Bear Lake region and monitoring, um, biologically monitoring local fish as part of this process. So they are now um, more engaged with their own self-government in this process. And now we are shifting to across the ocean to Asia. So although, um, one of the big goals of today's presentation was to be able to share more with you from the work that we've been doing in indigenous Kasi lands in Northeast India. Um, unfortunately, COVID meant uh, that we had to postpone a good um, part of this project. So instead, I'll share a brief history that I've drawn from public domain uh, media reports. Um, but the link to uh, our other um, nuclear colonialism and um, uranium uh, impacted sites is that Kasi lands reportedly contain one of the richest uranium deposits in India, which is estimated at something like 9.22 million tons. Indigenous accounting um, for the Kasi people focuses on boosting the biodiversity of their sacred forest and um, observing their ancestral land 
uh, teachings through tending medicinal plants and care of the forest. And I'll say more about that in a moment. For the Kasi people, counter mapping has provided an important strategy and through using ArcGIS story maps, Kasi are being empowered to tell their own stories, uh, combining cultural worldviews with spatial dynamics. Through interviews with Kasi traditional healers, we've built an interactive story map, oops, sorry. Um, and this helps situate Kasi medicinal work as one attempt to heal the land and preserve biodiversity. The origin story of Ki Hinyu Trip reminds us that there are many consequences when humans destroy their relations with the uh, more than human world without asking permission. In the 1990s, matriarch and landholder Kong Spiliti Lingdo Langren gave permission for the government of India to begin pilot uranium mining on her land. Kong Spiliti is indigenous Kasi and land ownership is controlled by women in this matrilineal community, which interestingly is very much like the Navajo uh, system as well. After two years of pilot mining, locals found rotten fish sorry, fish with rotten flesh floating belly up in local rivers and a rash of severe birth defects and pregnancy complications. And these images are much more recent. Uh, Kong Spiliti and her extended family were of course very worried by these findings and they reversed their position. She flatly refused, no uranium will be mined on my land was her position. After uh, this change of decision, uh, the state uh, stakeholder continued prospecting for uranium um, in the in the lands around uh, the traditional uh, uh, Kong Spiliti's family lands, hoping to find another route to access the uranium deposits. Um, and uh, today, these landscapes uh, continue to be uh, impacted by uh, heavy metal toxins and other waste products. Um, which reportedly have not been properly uh, remediated or treated after the pilot uh, uranium mining in the early part of the 90s. So despite uh, generous offers uh, to Kongsability, such as a $6 million, uh, 45 crore Indian rupees uh, deal to sell her land, Kongsability refused to budge. Um, and today local media reports um, that her village uh, still cannot access basic infrastructure such as electricity. Um, their local elementary school was reportedly shuttered and they continue to remain hampered by poor roads. Meanwhile, uh, several adverse health impacts have been emerging since the early 2000s. This area is medically underserved. Um, so the area where her land is located is here in the square box. Um, and all of the info about the health facilities was from um, Government of India public domain uh, sources. So um, we have roughly one doctor per 14,000 people in this area. Um, so it's extremely difficult to access medical care, um, especially if the roads are not, are not uh, um, sort of uh, paved and made uh, improved. So given these infrastructural limits, traditional kasi medicines or non ai dawai kasi provide an essential service to fill these gaps. The arrival of the coronavirus in spring of 2020 brought new challenges for those with pre-existing conditions. People who had medical conditions um, were unable to travel to urban centers for their medical care. They couldn't fill their prescriptions because of lockdowns and the expense of travel. Um, and this has reportedly led to uh, many sort of um, compounded uh, deaths as a result of people who couldn't get their normal medical care. Um, and into this void, Kasi Herbal Medicines and Thriving Forest Pharmacies. Um, and here's one of the gentlemen that we interviewed with his daughter, who is a healer in training. So Kasi Herbal Medicines and Thriving Forest Pharmacies have become vital infrastructures as we document in the story map. Here's some examples. Um, and this is another um, local healer whose name is Kong Kladis. And she speaks about the difficulties of obtaining uh, the medicines in the forest because of the impact of um, limestone and coal mining as well as deforestation and cash cropping um, in this case. The state of Meghalaya is the pretty much the sole supplier for all brooms across India. It's known as the Jaru state. Uh, so this is another uh, impact 
Um, and here is another one of our traditional healers. Uh, this is Dr. Bob Boss with his uh, in his clinic. Um, so that is the story map, um, some examples of our story map. And I can provide the uh, URL if folks want to go and visit it. It's interactive and it's a lot of fun to scroll through and learn more about this amazing, beautiful indigenous land. So Western Shoshone, as indigenous uh, mapping back makes clear, maps are political. They enforce boundaries and they may introduce political cleavages between neighboring um, neighbors who cooperated uh, before settler colonialism. And yet nuclear test fallout and uranium tailings do not respect the arbitrariness of boundaries on a map. With the Yucca Mountain um, High Level Nuclear Waste Project, the region that has been proposed to cordon off um, the hazards has long been shared by at least uh, three communities, the Western Shoshone, the, the Southern Paiute, and the Owens Valley Paiute. And you can see the little square here where Yucca Mountain is uh, proposed. Um, in the 1863 Treaty of Ruby Valley, um, this is a friendship treaty which allows settlers to travel through Western Shoshone lands. The treaty does not grant permission for ceding any Shoshone land. Instead, it underwrites Shoshone land title to the entire region. And this sovereignty was actually recognized by the US Supreme Court uh, when the US Department of Energy attempted to force through a payment in order to get access to Shoshone lands for the Yucca Mountain uh, project. Um, meanwhile, if this uh, waste facility is constructed, it would contain uh, waste from 115 reactors that would be coming from 75 nuclear power sites across 30 states all of the waste streams channeled toward Yucca Mountain. And in June of 2018, um, I was very fortunate to travel directly to um, the home of Mr. Zabarte, who is pictured here, um, and meet with him and Mr. Joe Kennedy, who spoke with me about um, the Western Shoshone perspective on Yucca Mountain. Mr. Zabarte, um, in his words, we are the most nuclear bombed nation on earth. The Western Shoshone and their neighbors have also been subjected to more than 1,000 nuclear bombs, in addition to the Yucca Mountain proposal. This includes the Nevada test site, wherein the U.S. detonated one nuclear weapon every three weeks between 1951 to 1982, totaling more than 1,000. The U.K. also conducted more than 20 nuclear tests here. The double impact from decades of weapons-related radioactive contamination and concerns about a long-term waste repository cause further anxiety for these communities. This is because Western Shoshone live with the land in a non-settler way. These complex relations in the landscape infuse every aspect of Western Shoshone life, eating, drinking, sleeping, and medicine. To make this clear, Western Shoshone have collaborated on maps um, that focus on how they depend on rabbits, deer, antelope, elk, bighorn sheep, chuckwalla lizards, um, and deadwood, wood that it's um, dried wood that is collected in the desert. And here's some of the, their relations that are a key part of their livelihood. For healing and ceremony, Shoshone also rely on pinyon trees and the mesquite beans, there they are, um, as well as um, these ancient relatives, the bristlecone pine and the creosote bush, which is a powerful source of medicine. Kano Oki first became sensitized to nuclear's harms with the triple uh, disaster in Japan in March 2011. After he traveled to the UN, uh, delivering a scathing retribution of nuclear um, and nuclear projects at the UN Indigenous Conference in May of 2011. As he wrote, sorry, excuse me, wrong order. <laughs> we have encountered the worst and strongest God. Um, he continued to describe uh, the God whose name is radioactivity in this uh, speech. Returning to Japan, he, he performed a musical tour, which he entitled the Seaside Tour, which was located in the backyard of Japan's nuclear reactors, seeking to elevate local consciousness about nuclear and its risks. Oki collaborated with a popular Japanese reggae artist, uh, Rankin Taxi, and together they created a reggae-infused anthem. Sorry. 
Um, the song features a vocalized warning siren known as a peotanke. Prior to Wajin settler invasion, Ainu used the mournful cry of the peotanke to alert one another to tsunamis, fires, and other disasters. In Oki's work, the peotanke is used to shock the listeners to wake up. The nuclear accident, if it comes, it will impact all of us if we don't wake up and react and shut down the reactors. And this is Oki himself right in the center of the photo um, holding the tonkori. Meanwhile, in September of uh, 2020, the mayor of Sutsu, a town in central western Hokkaido, near the three uh, nuclear reactors uh, hosted on the island, suddenly announced a plan to host the nation's permanent geological repository. In response, uh, Oki's uh, posted this flyer to his social media feed. We do not need a permanent high-level nuclear waste dump in our ancestors' lands. And he posted the unequivocal thumbs down <laughs> emoji to emphasize the point. Uh, in response, um, uh, sorry. And then Oki became increasingly vocal about the long-term threat of nuclear um, uh, in the wake of Fukushima when he began to post and speak and bring into his music this consciousness of the connection between indigenous peoples across the globe through the nuclear fuel chain. However, uh, a major difference for Ainu is that unlike Navajo Western Shoshone or uh, the Delaney Kotine people, Ainu indigenous sovereignty over this land is not protected by land title. Um, they are limited in their means to express any opposition uh, to this project. Um, but residents of the town have begun to push for a townwide referendum in order to allow um, the local community to decide for itself. Um, whether or not they will move forward with this project. Meanwhile, the mayor is blocking it at this moment. And this is an example of some of the different residents. This gentleman is a fisherman um, exhibiting their uh, very strong opposition to this project. Um, and as I have mentioned, one of the major problems um, with, sorry, as I have hopefully demonstrated through these examples, one of the major challenges proposed by the nuclear uh, industry and nuclear power um, is certainly the issue of waste. And this is a problem that um, in many communities they face uh, all different aspects of the nuclear uh, supply chain and the nuclear waste chain as well. And this just gives you a sort of basic orientation um, so the town of Sutsu is over here, uh, number three, and Kamoane, both of these villages are, actually have offered up their land to host the uh, long-term uh, nuclear waste repository. And then Tomari is where the three nuclear reactors are located. Oh, sorry. Okay. So if we take indigenous demands of accountability to their relations, all our relations seriously, then we must also take on the greenwashing of nuclear. In the face of a climate crisis, which is making itself felt with deadly heat waves and infernal like forest fires, a reduced carbon footprint is a compelling aspect of an energy profile. But nuclear is anything but clean and green. This argument circulated enthusiastically by Bill Gates and James Hansen, as well as national governments uh, such as Japan, presents nuclear power as if it were self-sufficient, as if it simply were fueled by itself. But what and whom is erased uh, from this calculus is perhaps the most critical ingredient of the nuclear fuel chain. Nuclear plants are powered by uranium and they generate vast quantities of spent fuel containing plutonium, highly toxic waste that requires management for millennia after the energy is consumed. The lands where the uranium uh, is mined, the people who bear the brunt of the mining, and the lands and people who are targeted for the long-term waste rarely factor in the math. Beyond greenwashing, the nuclear industry actively diminishes and erases the labor and the livelihoods of indigenous communities who mortgage their health for their daily wages. What's more, indigenous relations with land, with their ancestors, and with community may be severed or forever transformed by the extractivist process both at the genetic level and in terms of sacred sites. Um, even when mining companies promise remediation of mining uh, or of tailings, they have no capacity to rein in the genetic changes that mining unleashes in the land, in medicinal plants, in sacred water bodies, in wild animals, in livestock, and in croplands. 
The mining industry has rarely kept its promises of occupational safety, and uranium mining in particular sentences its labor force to a slow death. But companies are long gone by the time these health impacts manifest. Instead, they are rendered invisible by erasure from physical maps, or they're symbolically erased when their lives, when indigenous people's lives are discounted by mining companies or policymakers. Inhabited by indigenous peoples and or people of color, resource wealthy regions are erased from maps or they are marked as terra nullius and emptied out of residence. One of the most efficient ways to do this is through wastelanding or through deterritorialization, therein rendering the land a geography of sacrifice. Under this process, resource rich lands may be devalued by marking the land as a wasteland because it is inhabited by minorities or natives, quote unquote. The physical beauty of the land is immaterial. If it is occupied by non-whites or non-majority people, um, uh, by definition, the material and economic worth of the land collapses. Feminist historian Tracy Voyles explains this as a counterpart to settler colonialism that she calls waste landing, wherein the value is emptied out in order to claim the land, remove its inhabitants, its indigenous peoples, and then extract the uranium or other mineral wealth. An indigenous Adivasi activist Ashish Birli describes this as the resource curse. He asks, how is it that a community can possess so much mineral wealth and yet its people be burdened by crushing poverty and a surge of physical disabilities. It simply doesn't add up. I began today's talk speaking about the slow violence of nuclearity and the arbitrariness of radionuclides colliding inside the human body. The behavior of radiation and its impact on the body is unpredictable, but the choices made by energy environmental and public health agencies are not. If we take this indigenous accounting seriously, the following analysis emerges. Nuclear settler states, in particular, those who have conscripted indigenous, indigenized lands and bodies in the service of techno-nuclear nationalism, such as the US and Canada, as well as nuclear economies, such as Japan, are deeply out of balance with more than human relations. And they may even be fingered as perpetrators of epistemicide, ecocide, and even genocide in the eyes of indigenous nations. As a bilegana, a gaitin, and as pareng, all of which mean Anglo or foreigner in Dine, Japanese, and Kasi, I am not able to do the work of decolonizing or eradicating the poison from these homelands. But embracing the spirit of anti-colonialism, I can seek to provide a platform for indigenous experiences and voices in service of making the contamination and its long half-lives visible. As indigenous STS scholar Max Liboron argues in their new book, Pollution is Colonialism, as an anti-colonial advocate, it is critical to ask permission and to be invited to collaborate, and most importantly, to make decisions rooted in rejuvenating relations with land, ancestors, water, and place. Situating indigenous bodies of knowledge in the center today, I sought to dislodge the dominant settler argument that low carbon solutions like nuclear power are viable or sustainable. Approaching ecosystems from a more holistic indigenous perspective also commands us to adjust our threshold exposure models and recalibrate the transit of toxins between humans and the landscape and then back into humans. I close with the words of Mirar traditional uh, owner, Ivan Margarula, uh, in her letter to the UN's Ban Ki-moon. I am writing to you to convey our solidarity uh, with those who see in Fukushima uh, a dire warning of the risks posed by the nuclear industry. This is an industry that we have never supported in the past and that we want no part of in the future. I urge you to consider our viewpoint in your deliberation with governments in relation to the Fukushima emergency and the nuclear industry in general. Please carry our voices forward. Kublai Shibun, Yardai Kire, Shukuriyaji, 
and thank you so much um, for your uh, kind attention. And I look forward to a um, exciting discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Lots of uh, lots of material for thoughts. I see there's a lot of discussion in the chat and in the Q and A, but. Um, I'm going to abuse my privilege of uh, being one of the moderators by asking a couple of questions first. Um, and um, I wanted to pick up on one of the threads that sort of went through this, just the, um, the plan to use Hokkaido for um, the waste repository. And you mentioned that there were two villages which were actually uh, vying to be the site and we see this in other places as well, that uh, various indigenous uh, communities uh, do try to take part in some of these nuclear activities, mm -hmm. despite presumably the knowledge of all this uh, past history of devastation that the nuclear uh, colonial uh, enterprise has wrought upon uh, communities all over the world. So how do we, how can we understand this uh, this sort of strange amnesia or sort of, you know, willful ignoring of this past history. Or well, that's mm -hmm. the way I see it, but maybe you see it differently. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the last part of the question was, how can we sort of... Um, how, do we understand, how, do, how can we understand the fact that some of these communities, so for example, in Canada, we see in the recent past that, you know, some indigenous uh, communities or companies run by indigenous people have volunteer to be developing small modular reactors uh, and so on and so forth. And, and we also talked about how some of these mayors were trying to uh, you know, compete to get the uh, geological repository on their land. So what right. is sort of driving that? Right, right. Okay, so um, I probably need to sort out a little bit um, the sort of the stakeholders in this case. So uh, I was giving uh, the, the example of Kano Oki because he has been one of the most vocal kind of um, critics and sort of um, Ainu artists or, or Ainu sort of spokespersons to really address uh, the nuclear industry at all. Um, the large percentage of the Ainu community is not necessarily speaking openly um, in public uh, venues, at least. They may be having private conversations, they may have concerns. Um, so it's important to, um, to flag the fact that the mayor of both uh, Sutsu and Kamoenai, the two villages, um, I believe their population is something like 3,000 and maybe like less than, uh, less than 4,000 um, apiece. And, um, but they're both uh, ethnic Japanese, um, also known as Wajin. Mm -hmm. um, and the vast majority of the residents in the town, um, to my knowledge, are also uh, not Ainu, so they're not indigenous. So that's one thing. But, but I think um, just in terms of um, a question, this is a, a really valid question, especially for communities where, um, where there's a large uh, sort of ongoing um, kind of developmental crisis in the sense that, um, and, and I would urge us to think about it through these lenses, rather than sort of um, blaming the victim, which is the sort of pattern we see in a lot of developmentalist discourse, oh, these people are, you know, these people kind of language, um, they don't have the means, they're uneducated, et cetera, et cetera. In many cases, um, it's a very strategic choice that is being made and we see it's and it's also an educated choice and there's um, in some cases there's a, an aspiration to sort of employing some kind of technological strategy to mitigate the risk or manage the waste or somehow sort of keep it you know over here away from from the sort of the water supply or the the place where people are, for example, grazing their their livestock, their sheep, in the case of uh, uh, Navajo Nation. Um, but in other cases, um, there's also kind of a desperation if um, people may be aware of the risks. Um, but I know of one case, for example, in South Asia, where the community has said, um, we recognize that this is a huge uh, burden for our, you know, our village and our families in the future. But right now we are starving. Uh, we poverty is, you know, our empty belly and the empty belly of my children is right here in front of me. And so I'm going to choose the future that fills my belly right now as in the economic choice um, of filling my belly and not fight against this, um, this potential source of income through labor in my village. 
um, and worry about the sort of long-term implications later on down the line. And that, to some degree, that kind of logic was informing um, Navajo uh, government choices for a period of time um, until they really began to see quite clearly the sort of um, the, the, the key issue that we can understand from the Navajo case, and I didn't go into too much detail because we were covering so much ground today, is that it is a multi-generational um, health impact, right? And so we have the impacts on the minors with lung cancer, the impacts on the families with gas, uh, esophageal, stomach cancer, um, et cetera. And then we have um, children and grandchildren who um, we have this Navajo neuropathy issue, we have miscarriages, we have sort of a long history of all sorts of health impacts. And so it wasn't really until people began to realize um, as the grandchildren of the minors or even the great grandchildren, when they went back and did um, monitoring of their homes, um, they were able to see that the foundations were extremely radioactive, um, that the Geiger counters were just uh, beeping incessantly. So to get back to your question, um, in some cases, uh, communities have some um, some sliver of information, like they have part of the picture. They don't have the full multi-generational kind of um, clear grasp of the risk. Um, and meanwhile, you have a, either a government stakeholder or a private company that is not interested in communicating that risk because obviously they have an economic agenda. And so what ends up happening is that people who have sort of half of the information or even, you know, less than that um, are trying to make long term decisions that will impact many, many generations down you know, uh, into the future and not having access to sort of full information and or um, because of settler colonialism, because of these structural um, sort of blows that have happened to the community, they are left with so few choices that even if I wanted to move, and this is a story also that we hear from many communities, even if I wanted to move, where would I go? What resources do I have to help me get there? What sort of alternatives do I have? And I think the more important piece that I've been trying to make a point that I'm trying to make here is that, that um, the relationship with land place, uh, not only, you know, this generation living family, but ancestors um, is something that is much, much, uh, obviously each indigenous community uh, is different. I don't want to paint them all with one brush, but there's a different kind of relationship with place so that you can't just sort of pick up and leave and move to another land because this is the land that your ancestors have honored that has sustained you. Um, and that has enabled your family to have sustenance um, and cared for you, you know, for many, many millennia. And so you can't just sort of cut that tie. Um, and so there's, these are the many different sort of factors that I think come into play. And so in some cases, it makes more sense to um, sort of gamble on, okay, maybe we can accept this industry, but we can somehow manage it or mitigate it or demand that they, you know, follow our terms. Mm -hmm. um, so sorry, that was a bit long winded, but I'm just trying to incorporate all the different factors and it's complicated. Thank you. That is a very rich answer. And <laughs> I'm sort of tempted to add, add one more question before we turn to the uh, audience Q&A, which is to say, uh, is there communication among these different uh, indigenous communities who are facing these or are they typically fighting it on their own? Mm. Yes, excellent. Um, so yes and no. Uh, it is, uh, it really depends on the place. Obviously, um, language barrier is a huge, uh, or language barriers rather can be a huge problem. Um, so I've done quite a bit of work with um, Japanese civil society. And one of the things um, that I've noticed is that there tend to be um, difficulties in sort of linking struggles um, in Japan with struggles outside. So for example, really until Fukushima, you had this very um, long sort of hard fought internal struggle against nuclear power, like a criticism of nuclear energy in general, that was very much um, sort of contained, insular, not linking with um, sort of uh, comrades or allies or what have you in other countries really until Fukushima. And then, then it, it literally became sort of the global spotlight focused on Fukushima and people found ways to communicate. Uh, Peace Boat started getting in, well, they were involved before, but anyway, a number of different civil society groups became very active in sort of um, linking uh, activists, both indigenous and non around issues of um, 
uh, nuclear proliferation, obviously, but also around nuclear power and these kinds of questions. Um, but yeah, to get back to your question, so there have been, um, there's a range of uh, really powerful conferences, starting with, I believe, the 1992 uh, Salzburg uh, World Conference on Uranium, I might be getting the name wrong, um, in Salzburg, Austria, in the early 90s. And then from that, there were a series of different um, Uranium World Conferences that happened, including one in, um, in the Four Corners area, I don't remember which state, but in the Navajo Nation uh, lands, um, in the early 2000s that I know um, some folks from uh, different parts of Asia also attended. So there is that kind of solidarity work, um, which is certainly happening amongst uh, uranium impacted communities. Um, but one thing that I have noticed, and I, I wanna flag here, and I'd be happy if um, I get some pushback from folks and learn, um, is that ICANN, uh, the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, uh, that won the Nobel Prize in 2017. Um, and we have this wonderful UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, which is really kind of spearheaded by ICANN. So ICANN has been doing amazing work, but the uh, in terms of the way that it plays out in Japan and to some degree in Australia as well, um, there tends to be a focus on the weapons aspect of nuclear. So sort of nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation and less sort of engagement with the entire fuel, um, the sort of the supply chain for nuclear, which of course includes waste, both you know commercial nuclear reactors as well as nuclear uh, weapons waste um, and of course uranium mining and so when you factor in all of those components we actually have a range of communities who could be um, embraced in this kind of global umbrella of hibaksha or radiation exposed communities and um, in some ways i think it could really improve the visibility of the sort of long arc of the nuclear process um, in terms of their campaign. Um, they, they tend to focus a lot on Hiroshima and Nagasaki impacted hibaksha. Um, these are the folks um, that are often sort of um, celebrated and honored, and certainly they should be. Um, at the same time, um, it suggests to me that there may be some tension and sort of hesitancy to carry this anti-nuclear weapon uh, message and expand it to also include a critique of nuclear energy, right? And so I suspect that that is part of it, but this sort of erasure of uranium impacted communities, because if we if we really listen um, to the full story of um, even what happened in uh, the Delaney Gotine community or in the Navajo Nation community, we have an incredible um, history of human health devastation that really needs to be part of this broader conversation um, about all nuclear aspects. Um, you know, that's that's my sort of strong opinion. Others may differ, um, but I think that is a community where some solidarity work could could be happening. More solidarity solidarity work could be happening, um, in my thinking. Great. So I'd like to turn to some of the audience questions, and there's been a lot of them. So um, I'm going to be trying to summarize them, and maybe we can keep the answers a little short too. Sure. Uh, so one is from Courtney. She asks. Um, is there a way to safely contain or dispose nuclear waste? And the context is that Ontario Power Generation is looking at holding nuclear waste deep underground below the Canadian shield and asks, would this be, in your opinion, acceptable with the right consultation, conversations, and permissions with Indigenous peoples? So, <laughs> um, okay, so I'm not a geologist, uh, nor am I a nuclear physicist, but what I understand of this, um, this conundrum. I mean, I think we need no look no further than the Onkiloto project in Finland, right? And there's quite a bit of information, including a wonderful film. Uh, do you remember the name of the film? Into the Deep or something like this? I think it's, yeah, I can't remember the, the name. Yeah, um, but at any rate, um, so there's been a lot of work on this. And I think the question really becomes, um, how, uh, you know, sort of what is the kind of um, geological condition of the proposed location? Is it earthquake prone? Um, you know, sort of, so you have to sort of answer all these uh, very real logistical challenges, right? And then also sort of navigate the question of languages. How are you going to um, provide sort of signage and information to educate, you know, 
uh, humans, if we make it to that point, right? Like into eternity, thank you. Yeah, the film is into eternity. I recommend you guys um, that folks uh, check that out. Um, but so there's this question of translation, right? So how do we translate this risk to future generations of beings, whatever species they may be, right? Um, and then how do we, you know, sort of, how do we kind of uh, atone for um, whatever potential, atone for and also prepare for what a, whatever sort of potential physical um, and or um, climatic shifts uh, that might be coming uh, down the pike. I mean, we already know we're in the midst of a, uh, a very fast moving kind of climate um, emergency really, right? And all the sort of, uh, you know, it seems like every day one turns on the news and learns of some new record that was broken that was not modeled, right? That sort of exceeded the models that were anticipated. So, so the question of climate change also needs to be considered even though we're talking about a deep geological repository. Um, so, so really to your questions, it's about indigenous communities. And I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not the person to make uh, a choice about uh, any choice really for an indigenous community. They need to have their own process um, of engaging critically uh, with the science, but also the part that none of us can sort of uh, provide any assistance with is how do they engage with their own relations, right? So their own ancestors, their own spiritual processes and make peace with whether or not this is something that makes sense for them in their particular model. So I'm going to keep it short because I know we have other questions, but this is a complex issue and I, I, I do appreciate this because I'm just coming to, um, to your country and so I'm looking forward to learning more about all of these um, issues. Thank you. I'll just add that I think the other important aspect which you have to think about is the inherent uncertainty of predicting something uh, right. hundreds of thousands of years into the future. Uh, so Courtney, you will come to contact me. I can give you some more information as well uh, at, uh, here at UBC. The next question is from Teresa. She says, excellent presentation, Dr. Llewellyn. Um, have you examined the role of the national nuclear regulators in your comparative work? Uh, it's an open-ended question, anything at all about their role? Um, so yes and no, that's not something, um, so this, I've been doing different pieces of this project for a while and at the very, you know, at this very moment, um, I don't have anything concrete to say and I don't really want to speak out of turn. So I, I'm going to, um, sort of pass on this question, but, um, but if, if Romana, if you want to say anything specifically about this, um, please do. Yeah, I, I don't, I, let's just move on to the other questions. I don't okay. think I have anything significant to add. And, but anyway, Terry and I are in communication so we can talk about this okay. later. Great. Um, uh, question from Rob, uh, mm. if, you, if we are thinking seven generations forward, what do you recommend as non-nuclear climate change solutions? Fantastic, um, this is a tough one. Thank you so much, Rob, for your uh, question. So, um, I guess the first place I would start is mentioning that, you know, I'm not, as you can clearly see, I, I think that nuclear is, is not the transitional energy source and we need to quickly find alternatives. I guess I would, I would make two points um, to keep it simple. One is, I think we need to be very, very careful that we can just somehow transform um, our usual neoliberal capitalist habits into kind of a green capitalism that is climate friendly and continue with business as usual. I think that is a very, very um, dangerous uh, sort of approach to solving this huge problem. And um, at the end of the day, I know this is not popular with folks who are um, sort of on the other side of the fence about climate change, because I'm speaking from you, speaking to you from the States, um, I think we're going to have to make lifestyle changes. It's just, it's just that simple. And um, that doesn't mean that we have to <laughs> start eating cockroaches, for example, um, although they may be quite tasty if prepared properly. Um, but what it does mean is that we need to, we need to sort of think really creatively um, and not simply turn to the latest techno uh, savvy sort of solution. Secondly, um, a lot of the climate mitigation strategies that have been promoted that are, if you know, officially in the renewables category are not friendly solutions for indigenous communities. So this is something that really each indigenous community needs to be able to answer on their own terms, needs to, again, um, have a conversation, um, have community consensus and decide or whatever decision-making model they 
um, abide by. Um, and so they need to decide, does, for example, does solar make sense? What are the long-term um, sort of impacts of solar panels, which, you know, some of them don't have such a great uh, sort of profile in terms of biodegradability, right? What about nuclear? What does that mean um, for, you know, our sacred relatives in the sky, you know? Um, sorry, did, I meant to say, yeah, wind, wind power, I'm sorry. Uh, wind power, um, as well as solar, um, obviously hydro has a lot of issues. And I understand that uh, hydro is about, I think, what, 60%, 59% of, of the Canadian um, energy mix. So that raises a lot of questions. I know there's been a lot of tension with Indigenous communities in Quebec, for example. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, my hope is that there are alternative solutions that we might um, continue to sort of learn about in the future. But I think one big um, way to respond to this is we need to look at sort of micro solutions, community-based, degrowth, you know, shrink it down to a community level, a manageable level, um, and sort of uh, start working on solutions at that level and then move on, um, think, you know, how do we scale this up? How do we manage? Um, but there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question is from Susan. Um, thank you, Dr. Levalin. I'm wondering if you have more information on indigenous words or images used to describe and caution against the dangers of uranium, nuclear waste, etc. It'll be important to understand these perspectives to counter this industry. Um, I do not specifically only what I've, uh, so thank you for your question, Susan. Um, I only know what I've been um, very fortunate to sort of encounter in doing um, the work for this talk and reading. Um, there, there's plenty of, there's some information on the web, um, but uh, I don't know. So one of the things that's a challenge obviously is that I was bringing together, you know, Asia, um, the Western US, um, or excuse me, um, indigenous communities across the ocean um, and indigenous communities in Turtle Island, also in uh, what is now known as Canada. So a range of different um, communities that are in solidarity work with one another, but don't necessarily have um, their perspectives represented in sort of one single publication. So um, you're welcome to uh, send me an email and um, I can try to um, help you think about some sources there. But, but this is a really, really important question. Um, Whenever I could, I tried to um, uh, sort of honor the indigenous uh, language names for their nation and for, for example, in the case of Navajo, the Teitso, uh, your right word for uranium, which just means yellow dirt. Um, but I do think it's important because all of these um, cultural expressions, all of these ways of understanding are rooted in a cultural framework and a worldview. Um, and that is really at the key of understanding, not just sort of um, how we can make sense of the way that, you know, uh, nuclear colonialism impacts um, our communities, but also sort of understanding the grounding for how the community has engaged with um, either uranium or the waste issue um, or sort of the, the sort of risks posed by these things historically. And I didn't have time to get into it today, but, but actually there are some incredible um, stories, uh, not only stories, but incredible teachings in almost every community that I spoke about that, um, that address uh, your question in terms of thinking about the um, either ancestral relations or prophecies that were relayed or teachings that have been um, passed down. Great. Um... I'd like to sort of follow up with a couple of other questions. And if we have time, there's one question which I'm going to put on the side. Um, okay. One is uh, Prerna asks, um, as you mm -hmm. said, contamination from uranium mines and other nuclear activities are hard to observe. Mm -hmm. What methodologies can be used by activists and communities who lack enough resources to conduct extensive studies to counter the nuclear industry's narratives about uh, lack of con contamination? Right. Um, so this is this is a, a really um, excellent question. Thank you so much, Prerna. Um, and this is one that I've been struggling with actually for many years. Uh, so again, this has to be a sort of community, you know, at the community level and individually kind of um, uh, 
developed through collaboration, um, through lots of conversations and working through. And that's part of why I brought up the example of the, the monster of Teitso um, that gets uh, sort of destroyed um, in this wonderful Navajo way teaching, because I think that it has to be um, uh, customized, right, to each individual community and, and um, utilize uh, not just the language, although that's really important, but sort of translate into a cultural worldview um, and find a way that makes sense. So for example, I can tell you what doesn't make sense. So one of the, a couple of things that didn't work for the Navajo community is there were, um, there were a couple of scientists who tried to um, do the best that they could and they brought in a film and screened a film about the sort of um, alpha, beta, gamma and all the risks of nuclear radiation and tried to educate the community with the film screening it just didn't, it did not register with people. And then some folks came in and used this sort of model of um, nuclear radiation like steam, steam that comes in and kind of, it's it's not entirely invisible, but it kind of sneaks in and you can't really track it. Um, but that also didn't work because you have to understand that in the Navajo sort of cultural world, worldview, um, steam is uh, sort of sacred because it's part of the um, the the sweat the ceremony right the ceremonial um, space within the sweat lodge and so you can't um, translating that into kind of a poison doesn't make sense and it's it's quite offensive so so um, that's why I was I was very excited to hear about this um, wonderful work that the high school students uh, managed to do when they created this uh, documentary film and so again I'm not really providing a concrete answer but I think that's something you need to sit down and have conversations with the community. Um, maybe even test run a couple of different models and see how it resonates. And I would say always incorporate. Um, so in any work that you're doing, the, the goal is to, um, first of all, to ask permission. And then um, if you are you know, welcomed, then make sure that you bring stakeholders from a range of different positions, ideally elders and young people, um, all of whom have different sort of life perspectives. You know, the kids might be on TikTok, the elders are living in a very different world, so to speak. And it's important to bring all of them to the table and then together using that sort of collective space, develop a language uh, that makes sense to approach these questions. Um, there's a question from Cheng Yu, which is kind of the opposite of this or the obverse of this, where she says, I think the biggest issue is that scientists don't understand how nuclear development impacts indigenous peoples and the meaning of sacred sites. Are there ways, any ways to communicate with scientists to help them understand the cultural survival of indigenous peoples? Yeah, thank you so much for your question, Cheng Yu. Um, Absolutely. I mean, so I'm hoping uh, once we have managed to complete it, um, the story map that we're currently doing in collaboration, I'm hoping that that might be uh, one tool. But I think the other thing is you need to find ways to um, sort of scale up. So, you know, today I was really trying to honor um, indigenous relationships and indigenous worldviews. And so I was using a language that was striving to um, sort of center that perspective. Um, but if you are excluded, obviously it depends on what kind of scientist too, right? That's another question because, you know, I'm a social scientist, but I have very different training than Ramana, for example, who has, you know, nuclear physicist training. So I think the key is to really find ways to translate the language, um, uh, making it both valid and respectful of the origins, but also finding ways to kind of bring in um, some, some, for example, some figures or some other sort of frameworks, which help um, kind of translate it into the language of science, so to speak, um, just to simply, dim because, you know, again, this is a it, it, translation is, I think really translation is at the heart of this question, which is if we can see it on a map, for example, or if we can see it on a chart or in a graph, um, then we can um, sort of develop a grasp of it that may be quite difficult if I'm simply talking about, you know, uh, let's try to see the landscape through an indigenous lens, because that is a sort of cultural reference that is completely foreign, um, not to all scientists, obviously there are indigenous scientists too. Um, finally, I just want to say one, one little tidbit. Um, so the, the scientists that I brought up at the end, um, their name is Max Liberon. Um, they do really amazing work as an STS scholar and as a marine science scientist. And they are currently sort of transforming their lab to be 
um, essentially rooted, grounded in indigenous science. And so there's a model of uh, an indigenous person who is bringing an indigenous cultural worldview into a scientific uh, context. And I, um, if I have a second, I'll put in the chat, there's a great uh, podcast which features an interview with this uh, author. Great, okay. Um, that leads me on to the next question from Gunter, which is, uh, he says, uh, uh, Dr. Levin, and great com compilation. How do you envision to create this mapping project you mentioned earlier and how is it planned to make it available to the public? Yes. Um, so um, the, the, we're talking about the story map project or the sort of bigger, uh, let me see. Okay, you've already put in the answer category. <laughs> yes, the mapping project. Okay, yes. Um, so currently it's, uh, we have it hosted on a um, on our server here, but it's it is I think it's been published. We're we're sort of still um, doing a couple final edits, but so essentially we are um, promoting that um, because I'm in the middle of shifting between UCSB and uh, Victoria. I'm still sort of trying to figure out how to transition all of these projects that are sort of midstream. Um, but I'm very much interested in promoting this widely. Um, I, Obviously, I'm going to need to think about, you know, social media channels versus other um, aspects. Um, so the story map, it's hosted on the ArcGIS, the Esri uh, platform. It uses the Esri um, sort of um, uh, technology or the Esri app, the story map app. And um, the thing that I think is so powerful about it is that it allows you to um, create a, a narrative that can honor uh, an indigenous perspective, indigenous worldview, but also, again, do this work of translating it into the language that, say, geographers, social scientists, um, even climate scientists or nuclear physicists might appreciate because they can sort of see things, um, you know, aligned in a, a very uh, logical fashion, but it's also interactive. So you have some control over, um, you know, sort of how deep you go versus sort of doing a kind of a quick read. Um, so thank you so much for your question. Um, I think we should be completing our uh, event. It's now 1.15, but there was one last question, which you kind of answered, but maybe you want to add some more because I think this is a message that needs to go again and again, which right. is to say, would you say that nuclear dependence is a greater looming societal issue than anthropogenic climate change? Hmm. So if you ask the... Um, the bulletin, what's the official name? The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists? Yeah, yeah. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists basically ranks them, I would say, parallel. If we look at the doomsday clock, the reason that it was moved up, you know, I can't remember the exact number, but X number of seconds closer to midnight now, it's very, very close to midnight, um, is because of these two looming anthrop anthropogenic uh, threats. And I would say, Yes, anthropogenic climate change is a threat, but similarly, nuclear is also anthropogenic. I mean, this is entirely our sort of choice to free up the uranium and transform it into plutonium and, and the entire sort of chain of um, nuclear technology that we have sort of birthed over this past, you know, 70 plus uh, going on 80 years of the sort of atomic age, as it were. Um, and so I think... Um, my analysis is that it's really not one or the other. And that in fact, more than anything, we if we sort of fall into the trap of putting them in opposition to one another, we are misrecognizing the way that they actually feed into one another, right? So I think that we, um, we need to understand the way that, for example, climate change transforms a reservoir, which initially was designated to serve as the cooling water for a nuclear plant, right? Like, so let's say, okay, we have this great solution on climate change, you put our nuclear plant on a reservoir lake that was created by a hydroelectric dam, but what happens if climate change sort of transforms the river supply, right? And that reservoir lake no longer has enough water to cool the nuclear plant, then what happens? We have a climate change fueled nuclear catastrophe, right? And we could see, I think we could easily come up with a scenario of the of the opposite as well. So I don't think we can separate the two. I think we need to take them together and we need to come up with solutions that are not going to, you know, put us further down the path towards devastation by one or the other. We need to sort of think beyond 
Um, the sort of atomic age has brought a lot of benefits, right? Like we have nuclear medicine. There are things that have helped humanity, but at the same time, at what cost really is the question we needed to be asking. And is there any way that we can um, do this more sustainably? Because I think one of the things I tried to emphasize is that a lot of the really poor choices in terms of um, radiological health, uh, lack of standards, et cetera, um, that were made and sort of decision trees that were committed to early on were based on this rush to create the, uh, the sort of nuclear weapons through the Manhattan Project. And a lot of corners were cut. And I think we're now at a stage where we no longer need to rush in the same way. We, you know, I'm not going to advocate that, yes, let's go out and open a bunch of nuclear, uh, excuse me, uh, uranium mines. But I do think um, if we are determined to do, you know, to engage in continuing the lifespan of this technology, we absolutely have to think more carefully about how do we make it safer. There have to be smarter choices and scaling down the reactors and making them small modular reactors, I don't think really erases the problem. It just makes it smaller, but it's still an unsolvable, you know, threat that is of nuclear waste. We don't have a solution and we still have to get the fuel from somewhere. So that's how I would respond. Great. Thank you so much, Annalise. This was a great presentation, very rich discussion, much food for thought. And I hope that we can continue engaging with this question. This is just the beginning. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, our co-sponsors, the Interdisciplinary Histories Research Cluster and the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability. Uh, to the people at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs who made this event possible, uh, Joel, uh, Tina, and Lindsay, as well as uh, Tasha, who sort of um, uh, uh, who sort of began this event for us. And last but not least, uh, to the audience for great questions and participation. Thank you so much, and see you all some other time. And I should thank also, you know, the Musqueam people where I am uh, personally located. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of the hard work that went into this and a huge thanks to UBC and um, the SPPGA for inviting me. Um, I am extremely grateful for this opportunity. Thank you.